All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week. Just going to go quick for about 15 minutes on that Lakers-Pelicans game, and then we're coming back live tonight after the final buzzer of Kings Warriors on YouTube. So make sure you guys get over to YouTube after that game finishes. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss any show announcements. Don't forget about our podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops tonight. And then last but not least, keep dropping mailbag questions in the YouTube comments so we can hit them later on throughout the week. So as I said in the Sunday show, I was expecting more or less today's game to be ugly. This is It's really hard to beat a good team twice in a row, especially after you humiliate them. For the losing team, their pride is on the line. For the winning team, there's a natural sense of relaxation that comes in. And honestly, it was ugly for different reasons than I was expecting. I expected the Pelicans to kind of keep this game close throughout. The way it looked there in that first quarter was more or less kind of what I was expecting the game to look like. Pelicans get an early lead. Lakers kind of linger around and out-execute them late. To be honest, I was generally impressed by the Lakers in this game and the way that they kind of controlled and dominated things throughout. And really, they it was more or less just like what happened in the Sunday game. They went up big and then they relaxed and the Pelicans brought a bunch of ball pressure and speed onto the table and were able to kind of make things a little more competitive. Just in this particular game, the Pelicans made it super competitive and actually tied the game, I think, at one or two points. So it was ugly, but in a different way than I was expecting. The early success for New Orleans, couple of specific things, bringing the force. That's the, the big pendulum that swings in NBA playoff series is force. Usually the team that wins game one, you go into game two, you can expect the team that lost game one to bring more force. And typically the, uh, the team that won game one to bring less force. What is force? It's just doing everything harder. Cutting harder, screening harder, running in transition both ways harder, driving harder. Every element of the game, usually the team that's playing with more force is bringing that effort and intensity to a higher level. That's that pendulum that swings, and that pendulum swung a big way in Pel- in the Pelicans' direction. Well, a couple of schematic things, uh, they were using screens on Zion more often, so a lot of what Zion does offensively is they just set him up in that slot there on the right wing, and they space the floor, and he'll just go straight ISO. That didn't work against LeBron, because LeBron has Zion's number in a lot of ways, and I thought LeBron did a really good job on Zion again in this game, but they used screens to get Zion onto other players, whether it was Rui or Anthony Davis. He was going through Anthony Davis like he was tissue paper. And then also in the stretches where LeBron was off the floor, so like late first quarter, late third quarter, Zion was super aggressive to try to take advantage of those particular stretches, which was a big part of how uh, the, the Pelicans dominated those stretches of the game. Also in that fourth quarter run, Another big part of what helped the Pelicans kind of get back into it is the Lakers were chasing Jose Alvarado over the top of ball screens, which they probably shouldn't have been doing. Uh, Jose Alvarado shot 33% on pull-up jump shots this year, and he wasn't shooting particularly well in this game. I would have ducked underneath picks. That would have shut that action off. Instead, D'Angelo Russell was chasing Jose Alvarado over the top. Jose Alvarado was getting into the lane, engaging Anthony Davis, and dropping the ball off for Larry Nance, who was getting dunks and layups right at the rim. So that was kind of a schematic mistake from Darvin Ham that I thought kind of led to uh, a big part of New Orleans' late success. But again, late in the game, and obviously Zion getting injured played a certain factor here, but they did get a couple of buckets after that. Um, But the Lakers just kind of settled down offensively, got a few great looks. One of the consistent problems for the Pelicans in this matchup is they can't play Jonas Valanciunas. So when Jonas Valanciunas comes out, Anthony Davis just has a huge size advantage underneath the basket. I think he had six or seven offensive rebounds in this game. And on the key, one of the key possessions late, Anthony Davis got a, a, an offensive rebound and got to the foul line and knocked down a couple of big free throws. But bottom line, late in the game, it's LeBron James against Herb Jones. He gets a bucket. It's the uh, I, don't, I don't remember exactly what the action was, but the Lakers drew a double team. Worked it around. I think it was LeBron drew a double team. Lakers worked it around, and it ended up with a wide-open catch-and-shoot three for D'Angelo Russell. Like The Lakers were just going to get better shots down the stretch. That was more or less what I expected from the ugliness of the game, is it would be ugly, then the Lakers would get better shots down the stretch and win. People don't realize this, but the Lakers were the best clutch team in basketball this year. They went 24-9 and in games that were within five minutes in and within five points late in the game. And so they've been pretty consistently great at doing that, just getting a couple of key stops and getting a couple of key buckets 
in getting out there, uh, getting out of there with the win. So the Lakers get it done again. It was ugly, but like, you know, a couple big swing factors there. I thought Anthony Davis had one of those games where he just kind of doesn't have it. I don't know whether it was the back spasms or if it's just one of those things that AD can do sometimes, but he just was generally kind of floating through the game on both ends of the floor for three quarters. Did make a couple of big plays in the fourth. He had a, uh, a big offensive rebound put back. Then he got a block on CJ McCollum at the rim. Obviously drew the foul on the offensive glass late, so made some big plays, but AD was pretty disengaged, and between AD being pretty bad and Zion being pretty awesome, that was enough to give the Pelicans a chance to win, but alas, it was not enough. Uh, I want to shout out LeBron James because I thought this was a classic example of dominating a game without making shots. He was 6 for 20, tricked off a bunch of layups, barely made any jump shots aside from the big one that he hit over Herb Jones late. It was a rough shot making game for him, and yet I thought he completely dominated every facet of the game. First of all, the defense on Zion. When he was on Zion, they had him under control. It was generally when he got off of Zion, whether it was transition cross matches, transition situations where he was helping somewhere else off the ball, or when they were screening him to get Anthony Davis into the action, that uh, Zion had some impact. But LeBron uh, blew up a bunch of plays in the passing lanes. He was a great uh, rebounder in this particular game, got a bunch of key contested defensive rebounds. And then on the offensive end of the floor, generated just a ton of high-quality shots. And then a big one, I thought, was just his timely play in the key stretches of the game. They The, the Pelicans blow it open to end the third. Then LeBron comes in in the second quarter, just immediately takes control of the game, gets it back to the Lakers being in front. That actually led to the Lakers kind of dominating that second quarter. Pelicans go on a big run in the third quarter. LeBron comes in in the early fourth and immediately kind of helps reassert control when he gets in there. I thought he was great in the key stretches, great in the key areas of the game despite going 6 for 20. So shout out to LeBron. Lakers Nuggets. Again, like I said after the Sunday game, different teams this year, this time around. I think the Nuggets are actually a little better than they were last year and I think the Lakers are a little better than they were last year. Uh, the Nuggets have some of that defending champion type of swagger. Peyton Watson, I think has brought a, a real element to their bench defense. Uh, I think everybody in the starting lineup is a little better than they were last year. But on the Lakers front, LeBron, this is not LeBron with the bad foot. This is LeBron who's been playing I, I tweeted this out during the game, but LeBron post-All-Star break has been a top three player in the league literally he's been he's been it's been basically Jokic Luka and LeBron that have been the best players in the league post all-star break and that's like a fourth of the season he's been the only guy in the league post all-star break to average at least 27 points per game on at least 50 percent from the field and at least 40 percent from three they've been dominant when he's on the floor and terrible when he's off the floor LeBron's been at a higher level Anthony Davis is more or less the same player he was last year, although he's been a, bit, a little better handling uh, post-up double teams. Obviously, the Lakers' offense is more polished with their five-out sets. Uh, the Nuggets don't do as much switching as the Pelicans do, and as I did it, as I talked about in my contenders list, the Lakers can be a little susceptible to switching defenses. That was part of what made them go so stagnant. Now, the Lakers are capable of beating switching with LeBron and AD in size, but specifically with the Pelicans. That was a big part of how they kind of let go of the rope. Lakers went up 18. Then that Nance lineup at center, they started switching everything. The Lakers got stagnant. They started to take some bad shots. That's how you play the Lakers into their worst tendencies. And so I actually expect the Lakers to score more effectively against the Nuggets in this series than they did last year. But all of that said, Denver is the better team. I'm going to start my prep on that series tomorrow. We'll probably have that, break, uh, that breakdown with some film up later in the day tomorrow. But the last thing is... For the Lakers to have any chance to beat the Nuggets, they need Anthony Davis to be great. He got his ass kicked by Nikola Jokic last year. Pretty bad, too. To the point where in Game 4 in particular, when again when their backs were against the wall, I thought AD looked a little bit disengaged and a little bit like he let go of the rope. Like So Jokic kicked his butt so bad that AD kind of let go of the rope a little bit last year. That's going to be the, the factor that needs to swing back the other direction. Anthony Davis, he doesn't need to outplay Jokic, but he needs to get up to that level. And then LeBron James does need to outplay Jamal Murray. That's their only chance. I was kind of disappointed in AD tonight for such a big game for him to be as 
ineffective as he was, but he can make up for it by going in there on Saturday or Sunday, whenever the game is, and getting a big win in Denver. I think the Lakers need to win game one to win that series just to kind of maintain their confidence and belief in their ability to win. But I, I have big expectations for AD in this one. He's got to, he's got to show me something. It's it's something that uh, I think that he... I think he has an opportunity here to kind of reverse some of the narrative that surrounds him after that series. Because we went away from that series like, oh, Jokic is just way, 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 way better than AD. This isn't even much of a matchup. AD's got to make that a conversation for the Lakers to have a chance to win this series. And then lastly, before we get out of here, the Pelicans. uh, Again, I know it's disappointing to lose two straight games like this to end the season. But... I uh, uh, I think that this actually is shaping up pretty nicely for them. They match up extremely well with Sacramento. They're 5-0 and this year. They match up extremely well with Golden State. They're 2-1 against them this year, and they've won two straight somewhat convincingly. You're going to have that game at home. Beat those teams, whoever comes out of that, right? The Oklahoma City Thunder are a team that initiate offense with uh, a couple of guys that are 6'6 or shorter from the perimeter. That plays directly into the Pelicans' strength of their roster, which is perimeter defenders. And the Pelicans do not have the interior size, or excuse me, the Thunder do not have the interior size to punish the weak Pelicans' front line defensively. I will pick Oklahoma City to win that series, but the Pelicans have a much better chance of beating the Thunder than they do to beat the Nuggets. So as disappointing as this is, as long as Zion can get back onto the floor in time, I actually think the Pelicans are kind of slotting into a pathway here that makes more sense for them. All right, guys, that is all I have for this particular video. Again, I will be back live on YouTube after the final buzzer of Kings Warriors. I will see you guys then.